80% of the time you're hiring people that have been there, done that. If you're starting out, you might not be able to afford these people, but as you're scaling, you're going to need these people because Steve Jobs likes to say like, we hire smart people so they can tell us what, what to do, not so we can tell them what to do. The more people brag about the number of businesses they have, it's actually a negative signal. It's a red flag that they don't actually have a big business on any of those focused involves. That means focusing on the main business and being involved, right? I, I drink a lot of the cool aided and passwords like, oh yeah, you know, you should just, you know, hire a CEO and then let, let them do their thing. You read about that. That kind of sounds like solopreneurship, right? Like, you know, you go off and do your own thing. You know, I did that and things went like straight down. Before we start this video, I have one small favor to ask of you. If you've been enjoying all the effort we put into making these videos as best as possible for you, please hit the subscribe button down below so we can help more people every single week. Thank you. I see a lot of your contents focus on like the lessons you teach around your experience in business, which is like so valuable because you've nearly been at two, two decades, mm -hmm. but you always specify hiring, which is really important. Something that I've been good at and bad at and I'm learning at, you know, mm -hmm. but how do you do that more at scale with bringing in more people into your ecosystem to support the business, your yeah. content and everything? If you need to hire at scale, the way to think about it is how do you hire programmatically, right? So let's say you need to hire a hundred people or a thousand people. Like a lot of these big agencies, what, what they do is, and even tech companies, they hire in cohorts, right? So you hire in cohorts and you put them in a class, right? You're teaching them and, you know, maybe every week there's some type of curriculum that they're going through, right? It's almost like mm. you're going through university. Um, I remember doing that when I was like 18 years old. I was like tech support and then they put us into like these cohorts. Um, that's the way to do it. If it's like super scale and you're, you're getting a lot of leads because mm. the problem with, 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 let's say we get like a thousand leads tomorrow, whatever, we actually can't fulfill on those because if we try to fulfill on those, the quality of the work goes on a lot, which affects our current clients, mm. which affects our, our team as well. Cause they stress out about it. So you got to balance it out. Um, for us right now, like we, we get a lot of leads and there's, a, there's a publicly traded company that's about to say, Hey, like we're, we're down to give you like a thousand more, you know, qualified leads per month. It's a lot. Um, but we're like, we want to take it in, in, we want them to drip feed it to us instead of trying to take them on all at once. So, um, to answer your question directly, you know, if you're looking to hire crazy scale, it's programmatically, mm. but ideally what I tell my team right now is we want to be slow and methodical about it. And we want to have an unreasonably high talent bar because the thing I, I tell them every week is look in the next decade or so we are going to, we can only afford to hire the top 5% of people because the top 5% of people will understand how to handle 10,000 agents or 100,000 AI agents. Mm. Yeah, so and I hate using the word AI, by the way, because I think it's so played out with, with marketers. We like to like pollute things. It's been so polluted. In what way? Because it's, everything is AI. Everything has an AI label on it, right? Um, you look at all the talks, all the webinars. I'm going to show you how to do this, this AI thing, this AI thing. And at the end of the day, it's just like, generative AI, maybe they're using some prompts with chat GPT or some mid journey yeah. stuff. It's nothing too sophisticated, right? No. So maybe in the beginning that was novel, but you got to keep innovating. And so now I think it's cooler to remove the AI from it and just talk about use cases that are, that are awesome. Well, I think it's like counter trend, right? With every trend there's an equal and opposite force. So in the beginning AI was like, oh, it's new and novel. And you have this scare mongering, which is like, oh, it's going to take all agencies away, all regular jobs away. Mm -hmm. But then now when there's a label on AI, you almost look down on it in some degree, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's like a negative signal now. AI sales, any yeah. AI content, right? And yeah. you can you can basically look at it, anything on LinkedIn. You interviewed Greg, right? Greg mm -hmm. Eisenberg. Yep. I'll never forget, he had a post recently which said that um, he saw a LinkedIn post that was so badly written that he was so happy to see it because mm -hmm. it wasn't written with AI. Mm -hmm. And he actually liked the post as a result yep. because it's what we need, right? It's like- It's authentic. It's Im but it's imperfect. Right. And therefore it's not perfect, but right. it's on the right path. Yep. Yeah. I, I think, uh, look, who knows where all this stuff is going to go in the next five, 10 years. You know, we talk about artificial general intelligence and everything. I, I'm very optimistic about it, mm -hmm. um, but I think we're kind of putting the cart before the horse right now. Yeah. Well, especially for what we do, and this is why your content's been so interesting. Like how many episodes you recorded? Well over a thousand. For which one? That's what I mean, right? Yeah. So you have <laughs> so marketing school is over three thousand. Um, but keep in mind those are only like five to ten minute episodes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then for leveling up, I think it's probably it's gotta be close to a thousand or so. So that just shows obviously like who you are, it shows your values. It almost says exactly everything about you already and about what you're interested in. Whereas if people are just using AI for their content, it's almost like a flash in the pan. Mm -hmm. They're not going to stick with it. And when did you start that podcast? So it was 10... The first one, Leveling Up, that was in 2013. Yeah. Dude. So it's been 11 years. Okay, so... Maybe you, 2012. Your content has changed a lot recently. Yeah. I think on YouTube. Yeah. So when our first podcast was out, I think you were probably at like 40K. And now you're at like well over 150. Now it's like 160 or something like that. Yeah. What made you... What forced you to kind of level up and change? Well, 
I'm always trying to adapt. I would just say in the very beginning, it was called Growth Everywhere, the podcast. So I'll just say step one was I was just interviewing entrepreneurs that th those interview podcasts had a marketing spin to it. Mm -hmm. And that was unique at the time. That I started that podcast before Tim Ferriss even started it. And um, at the time, I remember I would post to YouTube and some of these would get like thousands of views. Like I know this is when YouTube was super easy and they mm -hmm. just needed a lot more content. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't stay consistent with it, right? But I would just say then the evolution was, okay, um, I started interviewing, you know, I started making more videos around marketing in yeah. general. They're more direct to camera. And then, you know, after COVID, I moved back into interviews like this, for example. And uh, I would interview people around like dating or finance or whatever. And those would get a lot of views at the end of the day. But then I realized as I was doing those, I'm like, you know what? One, I'm not too interested in these conversations. Mm -hmm. Two, this isn't exactly helping my business. And three, I just like talking about business and marketing at the end of the day, maybe some personal growth stuff, you know, with health because it, it relates to business. 100%. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back. And recently I've switched back into talking about what I want to talk about. And if I'm going to interview someone, it better be someone like, you know, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to have uh, Anthony Pompliano, right? You know, he's, yeah. he's, you know, in Bitcoin space. He's got a couple of businesses. Um, Seth Godin, right? Like I'm interested in those conversations. Yep. Um, you know, funny enough, like I, I did a dating one recently, right? And we just released it today, but we're no longer going in that direction. Um, that guy's got a lot of views. That video will get a lot of views. The last mm -hmm. one he did got like 300K long form views. But I'm like, who cares at the end of the day is it, if it isn't related to, you know, directly related to who I'm trying to target long term. And the quality of the audience. Mm -hmm. So a big area that I focus on with like all our clients and whatnot is, yep. are we getting the wrong views? Yep. So we've had some podcasts that are like, I'd say payroll, like as dry as, as, dry as you can imagine. Mm -hmm it would be more worrying to see 100,000 views on a payroll video yeah. than 1,000 executives yeah. that are based in the UK yeah. with an average salary of 200K plus, yeah. right? So there's like that positive and negative reaction. Whereas from my show, as you mentioned earlier, it's like, what do we talk about? We're more focused on sales, marketing, online business, mm -hmm. building. Yep. But it's much more natural to me. Right. And when I go outside of that, yeah. you kind of... You break your own rules by yep. understanding what the rules are initially right. and then leaning into what you want. So like that's a good way yeah. for you to be able to do 10 years yeah. <laughs> plus. Of, of experimentation. And, you know, I heard a phrase recently um, called the shiny knowledge syndrome. So it's not just shiny object syndrome. So mm. entrepreneurs get, you know, the entrepreneurial ADD. We, we do too many things. We try all these different things. And especially in the online space, you hear these people that have 10 different businesses, right? Mm. I, I, I've learned, you know, now that I'm in my, my, my 30s, like late 30s, right? It's just like, the more people brag about the number of businesses they have, it's actually a negative signal. It's a red flag that they don't actually have a big business any, on any of those, right? Um, and so shiny knowledge syndrome is you're consuming too many podcasts, you're consuming too many books, and you're, mm. you're taking any bit of knowledge and you're implementing without a filter, right? And so it's actually worse than shiny object syndrome because shiny object syndrome, you actually have to start, you have to stand a new business up. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. Shiny knowledge, knowledge syndrome can go on forever. And that actually ends up hurting your business if you have no direction, you have no goals. That's like the guys that go into every single program. They go program yeah. to program to yeah. program, mastermind yeah. to mastermind. Yes. And they're getting all the best information, but everything works. Mm -hmm. It's just about which do you want to disseminate, yeah. disseminate and move towards. Yeah. I remember you seeing gotta go a, deep. I remember seeing an old Sam Ovens video and which is like if you have what did he say? He's he's like famous for just like extreme focus to the point where it almost sounds like irrational. But he mentioned like basically if you have two businesses it's an indicator that you're broke. Now uh -huh. that's obviously not the reality, yeah. but it's but it's a good point though, right? It's and a good point. Yeah. He did it with consultant.com. He's doing it now with school. Yeah. What have you observed from like um even yourself with this? Because if I look at your ecosystem, mm -hmm. you have multiple different podcasts. Yeah. Single brain. Mm -hmm. You have the new networking events, yeah. which is crazy. And then you have the book. Mm -hmm. Now I I would look at that thinking that's all part of the ecosystem. But what do you think within there yeah. pulls you away from the goal or does it all? Totally. Connect? Yeah. So I remember maybe like four or five years ago, it was, you know, we had a software going on. We had the, the book launch coming out. We had uh, education product as well. And then we acquired two agencies at the same time. And then we had like, you know, probably a couple other things going on. Right. Mm -hmm. I would say the book's unrelated. The book was just a passion project of mine. So, and that was launched like uh, three, four years ago. Really? Why yeah. Why, why wouldn't that set into? Because it's such a... That book is like a personal growth book. It's it's really designed for my 15 year old self because I played a lot of video games, right? And yeah. that was my my way of, um, that's how I look at life. It's like a video game to me. Um, that's for like anybody that plays a lot of games that has no confidence, right? Like the, the teenager version of me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really relate to marketing uh, much at all. Um, maybe there's a chapter on it, but I would say the main thing I focus on right now is single grain, like by far, it's the most focused I've ever been probably in the last, last couple of years. 
Um, and then, you know, the podcast that I do, um, marketing school definitely relates to it. And we get a bunch of clips from it too. It helps with views at the end of the day. And um, the other one, now that leveling up is focused back on business and marketing. It That I would say is part of the ecosystem. And then the, the agency group that we have, uh, that Neil and I have, my, my podcast co-host, we, our intention there is to build a vibrant community, hmm. but also to see who we can partner up with or to, who to potentially acquire. So it does help single grain as well. Yeah, man. So I'm in a, an agency group like that as well. It's basically taking like six to seven figure agencies to eight figures. Mm -hmm. And the guy that owns it, like absolutely one place either to partner with or to acquire yep. in that regard. Yeah. And that's what even type of integration is that? Is yeah. that vertical integration? No. Yeah. I mean, it can it can be both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what's the group called? Uh, agency 8x so okay, it's agency 8X. gen flows yeah. uh you know gen flow no they basically partner with it used to be influencers so like your big uh, fitness creators mm -hmm. content creators uh but now like ali abdal stuff you've you know, oh he's yeah. in there you no, know, they've partnered with those companies okay yeah and they build the products on the back end mm -hmm. so they do like the socials and they also do the product on the back end they're working with lara costa at the moment in particular they're moving more into linkedin and they're mm -hmm. going to be working on like building the for products and stuff on the back end. Oh, interesting, yeah. But like their approach is, like they've done big day with Iman Gadzi and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So they probably get paid on the retainer and then yeah. get paid on the on the performance on the other side. Yeah. Which, you know, I think we've taken a leaf out of their book too in a podcast space specifically. Mm -hmm. But I want to just focus specifically on the content. So if I look up your YouTube, mm -hmm. your thumbnails have gone crazy recently. Like the quality, the way you're running the episodes. Do you think that that approach to basically to follow like the best trends and the, the thumbnails and the design and the copy yeah. is at odds to the quality of the content and like this like we just sat down here like getting to know each other and chilling yeah. do you think it's kind of at odds to it yeah so I, I would say no because it the way we looked at it before was incorrect and we actually have a guy that's helping us right now josh um and so he works with a, a youtuber named george gammon he talks about macroeconomics yeah. and then ken mcelroy um, he's, he owns like $3 billion in real estate and, um, these guys are super busy. Right. But you know, when he comes in, like, for example, when we're doing a podcast, like he was just mentioning earlier early this week, he's like, dude, like if you're going to do a podcast, like make sure that the first question you ask, that is the hook. It better be a banger. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the episode is going to suck. Cause your 30 second retention is just going to drop off. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Um, so I'm like, the idea is more important than anything. I think that's something we can all get behind. Um, oftentimes, you know, in the past, I used to just kind of jump into things and start recording whatever's on my mind. But um, the packaging is what matters at the end of the day. Everyone talks about the packaging, which is the thumbnail, the headline, also like the, the first 30 second like retention. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's important. I think if I had to hone it down to anything, it would just to simplify it for everyone, it'd probably just be the idea. Yep. Um, because when we have a really good idea, for example, let's just say, you know, the um, we did an episode with uh, your rich BFF, Vivian too, right? The hook with that one is like, you know, her her secret plan to wealth plan to generate $25 million, right? Um, and she's always got like, she's got an, she's a little sassy, right? She's got an attitude, right? And so like, she's got, she's at clips all day, right? Mm. And then, you know, Orion Terraband, so that one got 500K views and then Orion Terraband, 300K views. And then the 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 hook was, um, you know, it was like um, modern relationships are doomed, right? That's the headline. And then the thumbnail was like Ken and Barbie, like, like fighting each other. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just like um, something about like, I think that, oh, this is super controversial. It was like, are women ruining relationships, right? Mm. <laughs> you just have people fighting each other in the comments. But those are two examples of good ideas. Would I do those videos again? Probably not because I'm more focused on business and marketing. Yeah. But it just goes to show you like the packaging, the packaging, the packaging. And you mentioned about the the topics being controversial. It's funny, the relationship space, because I have a lot of relationship podcasts too that have like yeah. boomed for whatever reason. And I think it's probably because people sit in their own camps, right? Yeah. It's kind of like in the business world, you have like organic versus ads, mm -hmm. agencies versus solo businesses. Mm -hmm. These things have just boomed out of, and no one knows why they have those beliefs, mm -hmm. which is when we get into the relationship space, the fitness yeah. space, the food space, yeah. super controversial, right? Yeah. But for you then, with your content specifically, because you still want it to be, you know, helping single grain and showing that it's real, it's not like a clickbait. Mm -hmm. And I think running that conversation flow from good intro into the actual episodes really, really strong. Yeah. How come those episodes sometimes have boomed to 400, 500,000 views as a result? Yeah, I think, well, one, the idea TAM matters a lot. So idea, total addressable market. Nice. So if you have, you know, finance or dating, it's obviously going to be a lot bigger versus like us talking about marketing, for example. Yeah. That TAM's way smaller. So like, you know, um, I like Matt Diggity stuff on SEO on, on YouTube. 
he's getting like probably 10, 20, 30,000 views per video, which is great for SEO. Like yeah. those are really high quality views. Yeah. And so, uh, so one, you have a very large idea to him going back to finance and dating. And then to your point, you have people fighting in the comments all the time. So we have a vi we had a Vivian uh, short that we just kind of relaunched recently, like a short form. Mm -hmm. And that one got 6.6 .6 million views because you have the men and women fighting each other. And it's almost like religion and politics. Everybody hmm. thinks they're right. And you cannot win at that, right? And you just let them fight in the comments. It's fantastic. So, mm. yeah. But like, also, you're, not, you're just not getting the right people at the end of the day. Exactly, yeah. right? Like, are they turning into leads? And we'll talk about deep platforming in a, in a yeah. while too, if you don't mind. I want to ask you uh, some controversial to me, which well, is- Can I, can I um, just back up a second? Yeah. And like, there is- there are short forms where like Neil and I were recording marketing school where they just rip, right? One got like 3 million views. And it was one where I was talking about how you can go to um, Florence and there's a Loro Piana outlet there and it's really expensive clothes and you can get it for 70% off. And we're talking, these are like typically thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm. And that one did well because I was educating, but I was telling a story at the same time. And um, from that one, I got a couple of texts. One, one was a CMO of like a multi-billion dollar crypto company. And he's like, dude, I really like that, right? And even yesterday, I was at a at, at a dinner, and then uh, my friend's wife was there. She's like, dude, I saw your Florence thing on Laurel Piana, da da da, hmm. right? Um, and so those to me are like, those are higher quality views. You know what I mean? Because it's me telling the story, and they're getting value from me. And then you have people texting me. So there are ways around it where you, um, I think you can hit like an affluent audience, and yeah. that one was a perfect one. But people buy the story, not the product, right? Yes. Yes. That storytelling component is, uh, it's everything, right? Mm -hmm. Because we could talk about the same shit, the same funnel, the same ads, the yeah. same SEO, but yeah. the way that you frame it, it's mm -hmm. going to be so important. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about ads. Yep. Specifically around podcast ads. Do you have much experience with that? What did you mean? So my like evolution of understanding podcast ads specifically has been on audio initially. Mm -hmm. They People did shout outs mm -hmm. and whatnot. Then it evolved into you could advertise your podcast mm -hmm. on Buzzsprout, Anchor, and so on, yep. which was weird because, well, actually it wasn't weird. What I found out about that was people were, people were getting a download mm -hmm. by sending a push notification. So it would say kickoff sessions on your phone, you would swipe it away and it would say a download. Yep. It's kind of artificial. And then it moved now into YouTube ads. So now you can promote a YouTube video and get 50, 100, 400,000 views for like $400 yep. and then bring in a bunch of um, subscribers but if you look at the YouTube analytics, mm -hmm. the retention rate is like two seconds mm -hmm. on the video. Mm -hmm. Have you, how do you think about that? Like, have you considered that in yeah. your ecosystem? I'll just say what we've done with podcast ads on, in terms of selling ads and then how we've, how we run ads for ourselves. That's ads versus only, sponsorships now though. Yeah. I can, I can speak to just our experiences yeah. there. And then, so there'll probably be some gaps in what you're looking for. Um, so I would just say for us selling sponsorships in the past. So we had a, um, a, a hosting company that's actually nearby here called DreamHost. And they were paying us about 60 grand a month or so. And um, that was like a three, four year deal. And um, we, it was just a 30 second ad. We never had to refresh it. They never asked us for analytics. They never asked us for help. Like it was the best deal ever, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's harder to replicate because they really were fans of Neil and myself. Yep. And um, so you are able to sometimes get those sweetheart deals. Um, I will say right now, we're, we are talking to a, um, like a MarTech company where... Um, you know, we're, we're close to getting a deal done where it would be like potentially a hundred grand a month or so. Mm. Um, but that is also on brand affinity as well. So I would just say like, you know, the, the no like and trust factor that matters quite a bit. Um, who knows if the deal will get done, deal gets done or not, but um, they reached out to us. So we'll see mm. if that happens. Those are few and far between because we try to get it done with other people. We try to go with like iHeartRadio um, and they, they were great. I mean, but at the end of the day, we just had a lot of like random, like, you know, therapy ads and things like that just didn't quite make sense to our audience. Mm -hmm. So that's like us selling sponsorships. I would say us having sponsorships on our podcast in terms of like our own products. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of maybe going around your question a little bit, but still hopefully helpful. No, of course. But we, um, we, we're promoting like our agency owners association in the, in the pod. And that's growing that community to like a five figure uh, MRR right now, right? Monthly recurring revenue. And we're not even like fully like, I think we'll, we'll end up selling it for a lot higher, like a, probably like an annual program. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it's already doing five figures right now is, is kind of amazing, right? And it's just like, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here's this community. Go to marketingschool.io slash agency to learn more about it, to grow your agency. Um, that's actually worked pretty well for us because the people that come through that page, that page, we, we run it on school. Um, that page converts at about 2.53% or so. What? Yeah. Well, it's an authority frame. 
Yeah. Right. You and Neil mm-hmm. specifically, you've done the work, you've built the agencies. Yeah. It's this nine figure agency owner giving yeah. people advice to yeah. go zero to one or whatnot, yeah. right? What I was kind of focused on was more about actually ads as in you run the ad button to promote mm-hmm. your own videos. Yep. Yeah. And you know, I've seen those kind of pop up and kind of go randomly. Whereas yeah. in contrast, we've run sponsor we will we do sponsorships. We do the deals on the back end yep. with our agency. So your AG1, your Eight Sleep, all these kind of companies. Mm-hmm. Um and it's the what the numbers are absolutely wild. Like they're so literally wild. We've done this with um there's a handful of companies we we've done this. I, actually, so we we did a we did a podcast sponsorship swap with uh, my first million. Cool. So with my first million HubSpot network, we also did this with marketing against the grain. So we do do these collaborations. And where we got this from was um, Jordan Harbinger. I think that's still his name, right? Yeah. Um, Art of Charm is still his podcast. No, actually, no. It's a Jordan Harbinger show. Yeah. yeah. So um, he likes. He I think he spends seven figures a year running ads on other podcasts, and he'll sponsor them. Right. I was like, oh, interesting. Maybe we don't necessarily want to spend, but like with my first million, it's it's a well, you know, known podcast. And so what we do there is we use a, we were using Chartable and Chartable allows us to kind of share podcast data with each other. So we can see how many people are converting over, which is, you know, how many people are actually clicking through um, to, to see like when they run an ad, how many people click through and vice versa, they're doing the same thing. So we mm. do that. We don't necessarily uh, pay for podcast ads and uh, we'll do swaps too. And um you know, that's, that's worked out pretty well for us. And, um, then from that, that actually leads to collaborations. Like we're doing one with HubSpot's marketing against the grain podcast on Friday. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in addition to doing the swaps like that, we do these, um, podcast collaborations where we kind of get to, you know, take advantage of each each person's audiences. So that's the experience share I can give you there. But in terms of the other stuff you're talking about, probably not as much. No, it's just interesting because again, it's the early stages of that, but you're, so much further on the sponsorship side. I didn't realize that was charitable. That's really interesting. Yeah. Because we don't, there's another um, platform called Mag, Magillan. Magillan. Never heard of it. They basically do uh, analytics for this stuff as well. Magellan. Though. Magellan. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. It, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're a good platform for that as well. Yep. And you can see basically where the money's flowing. Mm-hmm. Um, and who's, who's running the ads. Who's yeah. running the ads, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about the, um, the rule of three years. Yeah. So the rule of three years is if you want to build anything amazing, whether it's a business or an audience, it will take you always three years. The first year is going to be hell, right? Second year, you're still slogging it through. And then through the third year, you're really going to start to see some traction. So let's say you want to build a seven figure business. Not going to happen. Usually it doesn't happen the first year unless you strike lightning in a bottle um, because you, there's a lot of patterns that you have to pick up. It's, it's Business is just about pattern recognition at the end of the day. Mm. And even with the Growth Everywhere podcast, when I first started it, only nine downloads a day after the first year. Second year, only 30 downloads a day. And then the third year, that's when it started to get moving. That's when we started getting like maybe 1,000 or like 1,500 uh, downloads a day. Mm. And the thing that is going to keep you going is one, are you learning? And then two, if you're creating content, you know, are people leaving comments every now and then? This is the, these are the unsolicited responses, right? It's like, oh my God, how come this isn't getting more views? Um, this is criminal that this isn't getting more views, right? That's when you know you're moving in the right direction and you have to stay consistent because mo- most people just end up giving up too early because they're vain. Mm. And what I mean by that is they're so self-conscious about the views. They're so conscious about what self-conscious about what other people think about them that they're not focused on their own learnings. <laughs> that's why that's why podcasts are so difficult to grow. And that's why Instagram is so easy to stay with because it's just the likes, right? Yep. People just flash your abs, flash your ass, they're going to get likes. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's short, well, it's obviously like extreme validation mm-hmm. in the short term, but yeah. no one's willing to build. And that's why it's funny because like the businesses that you've had, reasons why I admire your work is because you've just played the game at a high level for a very long time. Thank you. You know, and if you compare that to your 22 year old on Twitter who has yeah. an eight figure agency, yeah, you can just see the levels of, yeah. of game, right? Yeah. And you can see when they're talking in their videos direct to camera, there there are elements that are missing that they're, they're that they're conveniently leaving out because they have to foster this image, right? Why? Because they have to foster that image to to, to sell masterminds, courses, and things like that, right? Did you ask why? Yeah, why? Yeah. So wh- why why did they have to fake it? Yeah, almost like a, at a there's obviously the technical level that their business yeah. isn't growing, but almost yeah. at a subconscious level too. Yeah. So one thing is they have to fake it because. This is interesting. I'm not going to name any names, right? But it's like, oh, like I sold my my eight figure agency and now I'm selling courses. Wait, how does that make any sense? Sure, you make amazing videos and you're getting millions and millions of views. Um, again, I'm not going to name names. Some some people are some of these people are getting like hundreds of millions or 200 million views a month or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
when you start to talk about business, there isn't a lot of substance. And when you're looking at the videos, it's super well, well produced, but what are you showing? Oh, you're showing your Lamborghini. Oh, you're showing that you're traveling to Dubai. You're showing all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, where's the actual substance? Where's the actual, like, when you hear someone like uh, my, my friend, Ken McElroy, who, who lives in Scottsdale, he's like, yeah, I'm $1.2 billion in debt right now. Um, well, why? And well, the, there's, uh, the banks don't want you to know this. This is what you got to know. Um, this is what you need to know about infinite banking. Like they're going deep, right? Mm-hmm. When it feels very surface level, it probably is. And when they're showing you other things to, to compensate, um, it's because again, they don't have that depth. And then the other thing is they want to sell you something else. And I actually don't hate on courses. I think courses are great. I think masterminds are great. Mm-hmm. It's just that the majority of people that, that sell that stuff um, they're looking to make a buck. And this is why when you go to a lot of masterminds, I'm sure you've been to a lot of masterminds, there are ones where all they care about is just making money. And those are just not for me, right? Because the ones, the people that are long-term, the people that are long-term are very humble and they typically will just make money, a lot of money long-term because they're not focused on the next thing. They're focused on building for 30 years. Do you want to grow and monetize your podcast, but you don't know where to begin? Have you tried all the tricks and hacks, but nothing has worked? Have you been wasting time, money, and energy and seeing an analytics chart with no growth? That's where Evox comes in. We've been helping podcasts grow and monetize their shows for many years. We've grown shows to over 100 million views, done over 10 million downloads, generated over $2 million in only the last year alone. And we can help you grow and monetize your own podcast. We've had some shows go from absolutely zero. We've had some of the biggest influencers in the world come to us to help and improve their show. So if you want to learn exactly our podcast growth flywheel and exactly how we can do this for you and completely replicate success, Schedule a call right down below myself and we can go through the exact model for you and to grow your podcast this year. Mm, it's infinite game, right? Yep. It's part of the infinite game is it's not about the short-term cash. It's not about the quick win, mm-hmm. but paying, playing the bigger ecosystem play. Yep. It's interesting because I've heard you mention about it's not just always about the financial side, the money side. And that's why I think these offers to get you to 10K a month and stuff, they just don't have then they're not of substance. Whereas like you've built an actual business. Mm-hmm. I've been building a business for a long time. Yeah. I, you do what you say, you do what you do and you mm-hmm. say what you do. For us as well, we've been trying to show it at such a high level. And that's mm-hmm. why like the ultimate social proof, I think is yourself yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. And then, yeah, you can throw in under case studies and testimonials, but mm-hmm. you have to do it for yourself. If you're yeah. selling, if you're selling like a, a fitness package, you have to be shredded. Mm-hmm. If you're selling yes. Ken yes. McElroy's yes. Uh, service, you have to know about finance yeah. and debt financing and investment banking and all these different things that you can't just skip that part. Mm-hmm. But but why is that? Like, so the online space right now, you're you're in a nice area of the online space, which is much more like, it's much more of a mature market, I think. You know, yourself, Neil, Tim Stoddard, um, Charles Miller, like you guys are much more further on the journey. But for younger guys in their mid-20s, it's a shit show. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think for the younger people, and maybe this is me, me speaking to my 20-year-old self, it's, you know, as long as you stick with it, not, it's not a one year thing. It's definitely not a five year thing. It's not a 10 year thing, but it's 20, 30 years. You'll be fine. And I had, I had dinner with a, a client, um, a single grain client the other day. And, you know, he does a hundred million a year in, in revenue and it's bootstrapped and it, he owns hundred percent of the equity, I believe. Um, and the guy's in his sixties and he's like, dude, man, like, it's not like I'm really smart or anything. I just worked on one business cause I can only focus on one thing and it's been 30 years. And then, um, similarly enough, um, there is a billionaire heiress and she told one of my friends that, Hey, you know, um, I got some advice for you. Um, you know, my family, everyone around me, my grandfather, my father, my brothers, they built multi-billion dollar companies. And the way they've done it is they've just done it for 30 plus years Mm -hmm. and they focused on one thing. And the problem in your twenties is again, well, it's good that you're experimenting, but once you find something, stick with it. A lot of people, it's like, Oh yeah, you know, I'm not even talking about that, that. The one guy I was just mentioning, oh, I, I shut down my eight figure agency. So there are multiple people where they stopped at eight figures. It's like, well, why did you stop at eight figures? It's because the boss that was that was facing you, you weren't ready to beat that boss, right? And you gave up and decided to start on something else. Mm. Um, that's what happens to most 20 year olds. I think we lose faith, or at least talking to myself at 20, it's like, I, I didn't have the confidence to go to the next level. But had I just stuck with it, it would have been fine. Do you think there's merit to having so it's one business, but multiple offers inside the business. Totally. Yeah. So when I say one business, it's everything you do inside of the business is tied to that, that one thing. So for, for example, single grain, right? It's where we're, we help people um, drive more customers. We want to be the most innovative marketing company that drives customers, right? So anything that can serve that for our clients. I think that the challenge I had in the past was 
you know, oh, I have a senior living website. That's definitely not tied to single grain, right? Senior living. Yeah, a senior living <laughs> affiliate website, right? Or I had like a quiz SaaS, right? That has nothing to do with single grain. Um, and then I had like the book, which is a passion project of mine, but like that took a lot of time and effort. So it's like, those are distractions from the main thing. But now all my distractions, if you can channel it into one thing, like my, my two podcasts, the distractions are channeled towards single grain. Mm. My distraction with uh, Agency Owners Association, that is channeled towards single grain as well. Because mm. that was a problem that I had. So I was doing the Sam Ovens approach, which is like bang your head off the table until you get to eight figures a year, yeah, yeah. which worked. Like uh, I'll be completely transparent. The agency the done for you podcast side yeah. is probably at around 50 to 60,000 a month, uh -huh. but it's very team focused, yeah. operationally heavy. Yeah. So then, and that was done for you, but it's high ticket. Well, high ticket is all relative, but it's like 5K a month. Yeah. So then we left 99% of the market out because mm -hmm. most people can't afford that. Yeah. So that's when we developed the incubator, which is mm -hmm. more of a coaching program. Mm -hmm. So then in my head, I spent six months being like, is it is it good? Is it bad? Is it yeah. good? Is it bad? And I was like, fuck it, let's just do it. And yeah. funny enough, what's happened is when I run an offer for the done for you service, I get more people in the incubator mm -hmm. and vice versa. People yeah. are like, I don't want to do it myself yeah. or do it with you. I want yeah. it done for you. So it's something that I realized, but again, you know, you kind of, you connect the dots backwards. Yeah. You that know, what's, what's, what's interesting is, uh, so my, my podcast co-host, Neil, um, he had a lot of coaching offers. It, like, you know, we talked to all the people in the space back in the day. And so, you know, we had all the numbers. He decided to go go all in on it. And um, the the problem with the coaching he found is that the revenue capped out. Usually it caps out around 10 or 20 million, which is great, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, now he's got multi nine figure agency and, um, you know, the goal is to, how to, you know, it's like, okay, how does it go to a billion in revenue a year? Right. And so like, but that, that's completely different. Right. It's, um, so, you know, it just depends on what you want at the end of the day. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, it is what it is. True. There's pros and cons to everything. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, like you, you cut your teeth in agencies, you know exactly what's happening there. You have the other things around the corner. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, again, you don't hold the ego to it. Mm -hmm. You know, taking the extreme example of politics, you're not in this vote, this vote, what it's that or this, mm -hmm. you have that less of, um, emotional reaction to yeah. it. So 16, 17 years in business, as you've made these adjustments and you have some like a lot of lessons from here, what's kept you less focused on the money and more focused on maybe like the impact? Yeah. Is that kind of fair to say? Yeah. No, this is interesting because, um, so going back to Neil, we, we, we have, I had him take this personality test called Principles U, Y-O-U. It's the best personality test I've ever taken. Um, it's just super accurate, right? Like we have all new employees or people interviewing to join Single Green. We have them um, take a look at it or take it. Um, and there's a section in there where it says intrinsically motivated. So I'm 99% out of 100. So I really don't care about money. Um, mm -hmm. and it's funny cause when I look at Neil's test, he's 1% intrinsically motivated, which means he's completely driven by money. Right. Um, and we, we laugh about it because he's like, yeah, when I, so I've known him for like 13 years. He's like, yeah, I've never at, at any time felt you're driven by money. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just driven by the learnings at the end of the day. Right. So, um, hmm. I think maybe that's a way of answering your question around, um, you know, how, how I think about things. It's just mm. about learning and teaching. But the trouble for me is one thing you have to watch if you're, if you're like that is the shiny knowledge syndrome. Cause you can get really trapped on all these podcast books and things like that. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes sense. But you do, I guess, have the drivers towards the business though. You know, when you're basically, you still have a good idea of like the numbers within your business. Yeah. It's just the fact that you're not spending it on a Rolex. Yeah. That's kind of the difference here. Yeah. I, to me, it's it, again, going back to, it's all a game, right? So if I can get it to, you know, hundreds of millions or a billion in revenue or so, that's just like, oh, I leveled up to be able to do that. And yeah. that's just a scorekeeper over there. And mm -hmm. so I just think it's, it's, it's fun to be able to, it's like, well, why do you want to do that? Like, it's not like I'm being greedy. It's just like, because other humans can do it. And if other humans can do it, then I can do it too. So why not? Exactly. Tell me about that personality test. So what else is actually composed of it? It seems quite interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I've also used it in dating in the past as well. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, oh my, oh my God, check out this personality <laughs> test. It's so amazing. And they're like, oh my God, I want to take it too, right? I'm like, oh, please, be, please take it. And then they take it. Nice. Um, but it's about 15 to 20 minutes. It's like any other personality test. You're answering questions like, you know, how, how often are you on time or whatever? Like, you know, very on time. I don't know, right? Um, but, you know, it says a lot of things that are accurate about me. For, so for example, it'll tell me, um, it'll tell me how detail oriented I am, right? So details aren't my thing. So it's like Same. 6% out of 100, <laughs> 6%, right? But it shows that I'm actually very dependable. I'm like 82%, 87% dependable. Mm. And it's funny, it'll show me that, right? And then it'll show me like how practical I am. So I tend to make a lot of decisions very quickly, but I'm also not deliberate, right? So that means I'll move very quickly. Um, and usually the decisions will be good, but because I don't think through a lot of things, right? 
I'll still make mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. So like, I'll, I'll know, like, for example, if, if you take the test, I, we have someone on our team that's amazing, but he's very low on practical, like less than 10%. And so it, when, he's, when he starts to say things sometimes, it's like, it's clear to me that he hasn't thought through the second and third order consequences. And so it's, he's like, yeah, you know, we should just hire all these people. Well, okay, well, if, A, can we afford these people right now? And like, what are these people gonna do? But what about all these other priorities that we need to hire for, right? And so with him, because I saw that in the very beginning, I know that's like a weakness to work through. And just like people know that when they're working with me, um, they need to give me more of the, the TLDR um, and just get to the point, right? And so it's really un- important to understand your strengths and weaknesses there. And we have someone on our team. She's very, she's like a peacekeeper. That's her ar- archetype. Um, she's very low on tough, right? But that's hurt her because she withholds feedback, which then with- withholds progress for the company, right? Mm. So there's just a lot of dynamics there that you just learn to play with strengths and weaknesses. Well, looking at your example there, if you're someone who's less in the detail, but you're more persistent, that's going to be good as a CEO, yeah, right? But that's not going to be good as an employee. Yeah. Because an pl- employee needs to get the spreadsheets correct and yeah. everything in order. Yeah. And mm. by the way, you want to hire people that are detailed around you to cover for your weaknesses. Like, for example, Neil on the test, um, he's very detail-oriented. He's very tough, right? Um, his empathy is like zero. And like, you know, mine's pretty low too. Mm. Um, but like, you know, we all have our quirks. Yeah. And dude, that's something, I'm actually going to do that with my team as well yeah. because... Um, obviously agencies is all about client services, mm-hmm. right? And me who's moving at like trying to move at hundred miles an hour, mm-hmm. I was managing client relationships myself. Yeah. And it was fine when we had yeah. six clients, yeah. but when we had 20, 30 clients and customers, it's obviously way more difficult, right? Mm-hmm. And I noticed because I was less empathetic, mm-hmm. I was less able to relate to them not doing something or right. us being behind and whatnot. Yeah. So we hired a, my friend who's also a relationship manager as a yeah. result. Yeah. And he's the opposite to me. He was a teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, Great. A, yeah. He's high, very patient. Exactly. Yeah. He was a, not high school, less high school, primary school teacher uh-huh. in the UK. Yeah. So the guy like walks through problems with people and so on and so forth. And that was something I realized about myself. And mm-hmm. I was like, ah, oh, okay. I'm still going to try become more empathetic. Yeah. But I'm not, this is going to be more of like a lifelong thing yeah, yeah, yeah. than yeah. like a 20 minute change. Yeah, Does that yeah, make yeah. sense? Yeah. So that's why I've kind of hired and that's why I hire. Mm-hmm. I'd like to get your thoughts on this actually. So, you know, you've seen a big uprise in solo business, solo entrepreneurship. Yeah. You have, you know, people like Justin, Justin Welsh, Brett Williams, mm-hmm. all these guys have kind of led the way for solo entrepreneurship. Yeah. Would you prefer to have a team or to do what you're doing at a smaller scale, I guess, without a team? Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be a biased answer no matter what. I, I would prefer to have a team because there's so much more leverage in having it. And by the way, I don't, I don't poo-poo on solopreneurship at all. I think it's amazing that they can do, have a business. I, I think Justin says, you know, two or $3 million a year and a lot of it's profit. That's amazing. That's a good life for him. Um, but for me, the way, I, again, it's, it's a game, right? How do I swing for the fences and how do I play at a, at a larger and larger level? I think it just depends on what you want. Yeah. I do, like, the thing I've learned in the last couple of years is if I were to, focus it on, on, on one phrase, at least for me, is focused involvement, right? So that means focusing on the main business and being involved, right? I, I drink a lot of the Kool-Aid and passwords like, oh yeah, you, know, you should just you know, hire a CEO and then let, let them do their thing, right? Um, and so you, you read about that. That kind of sounds like solopreneurship, right? Like you, know, you go off and do your own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I did that and you know, things, things went like straight downhill, right? So, but going back to your question, um, I would prefer to have a team because I like the idea of building a high performance sports team. Hmm. I like the idea of coach, coaching high performers. Like I really love learning and teaching. Um, so someone that's really high level, I, I, I get a lot when I see the, the, the light bulb moments mm-hmm. and I see when they're, when they're producing, right? They're coming up with ideas. I get a lot of energy from that. Um, so it's just, it's just what I enjoy at the end of the day. Same. I'm the exact same as you. Yeah. Exact same. What like leadership lesson do you have around leading a team? What would you... Yeah. So I think of, you know, people look at culture. It's like, oh, this is like nebulous thing. I think culture is a 60 day moving average. And what I mean by that is um, it's not a culture we've had over the last year because it it changes very quickly. If you're maintaining a good 60 day moving average, which is like your last 60 days or so, right? Your culture has been amazing. Mm -hmm. That's all you can really focus on because you can acquire two other companies. Your culture is like completely different in the next 30 days or so, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're very intentional about it, then your, the, the bar stays very high. And then if you stay involved, you're kind of playing, you know, um, at least in American football, you have a free safety who's kind of sitting in the back and, you know, making sure that, um, you know, they're kind of the last line of defense, right? Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm staying involved and I'm jumping in on things where I can. And I'm, I'm really sprinkling my magic where I can. I'm not trying to micromanage necessarily, but, you know, when I show up, it kind of resets the bar each time. 
And I, I'm, I'm realizing that um, when that's not there, when the founders aren't involved, um, things just tend to drop a lot because nobody else is incentivized as, as, as much as you are as the founder because you have the lion's share of the equity. And so let, let's use going back to Neil again because we, we talk all the time. In his company, he has no direct reports because he's terrible with people. Um, and <laughs> he, he'll say this himself. He, we've said this on the podcast, right? No direct reports, um, but he's heavily involved. Like he's calling his CFO like multiple times a day. He's calling his executive multiple times. He's pushing the pace, right? Um, so going back again, focused involvement, and um, that's the main thing I've, I've learned about leadership. Because if you're not there, you're not present, then there's going to be no vision. There's going to be no direction. All that thing, stuff about mission, vision, values, it has to come from the founders. Yep. They set the pace. Yep. And everything else follows from there. And also you need to, I think anyway, you need to keep reiterating that pace. Oh my God. You have, you're the chief reminder officer. Yeah. yeah. Because otherwise like people are going to like, I don't know why we're doing this, why we're starting yeah. this new initiative. Yeah. You have people who are almost like sulking in yeah. the business. Whereas you need to be constantly showing up and setting the bar for it. But I think there's also, have you ever read Leaders Eat Last? Such an amazing book. Yep. I love, basically the biggest kind of point he, he specifies is, is giving like a circle of safety to everyone. Mm -hmm. So everyone can act their best, right? Yep. Uh, Hormozzi always says like, that if you have a problem and you hire someone and you tell them to do something the way you did it mm -hmm. and then they fuck it up, yep. you can't be mad at that person, yep. right? So you kind of almost have to allow them to, go off and do their own thing. Mm -hmm. We actually hired a new designer recently and design is, I all, I don't know about you, but I think design is really hard to get right, mm -hmm. get a good designer. Yep. And it took me, I would say it took a year to get a new good designer. Mm -hmm. And then when we got him, obviously he had a rough guidelines, but I was yeah. like, dude, all right, you know, I'm allowing you to be the designer that you want to be, obviously yeah. stay within these guidelines, whatever. And the guy crushes it, yep. like crushes it because he's feels comfortable, he has yep. confidence, Myself and our head of operations will yep. kind of review things and make sure things aren't like crazy. But um, I think it's a nice position to be in. And now yep. he, for the most part, he says that he, he's never been happier. Yeah. I would just say, you know, on one end, people talk about hiring people that have been there, done that. It certainly works in the agency world. I would say maybe that's 80% of the time you're hiring people that have been there, done that. Um, if you're starting out, you might not be able to afford these people. But as you're scaling, you're going to need these people. Because Steve Jobs likes to say, like, we hire smart people so they can tell us what, what to do, not so we can tell them what to do. But then you have the other 20%, which is maybe where you're hiring high potential, you know, young people. Yeah. And you're letting them kind of, um, you know, you're, you're guiding them. But then eventually they'll figure out things from because they're younger. They're way hungrier too, right? Mm -hmm. Versus the people that have been there, done that, the more established in their careers, they have families and everything. So you want to have a good mix. You, you want to have a good, healthy tension at the end of the day. Um, and then, you know, again, you're just up there, chief reminder officer, maybe you're, you're jumping around sprinkling the magic a little bit. Mm. Um, but again, focused involvement. I think that's probably the biggest leadership lesson for me because I going back to shiny knowledge syndrome back in my twenties, I read a book called let my people go surfing. Right. And that was from the Patagonia founder. And I, I've told this story a, a couple of times, but it's just like, you know, the concept behind the book, it's like, Oh, Patagonia, you know, you have these really cool vests. They did, they have really high quality products. Right. And they've done really well. They've steadily grown over the years. And he would let his people go surfing during lunch. I was like, that sounds really cool. I immediately took it without even thinking about it. Okay. So I didn't filter this knowledge. Okay. And I just stopped showing up to the office. And then what happened afterwards? Everything started crumbling, right? This is the first time everything started to crumble. Um, people would come to the office watching Family Guy or in pajamas. People wouldn't even show up to the office. People would just be eating chips and not working, right? And then, um, you know, I remember someone a couple years later, um, he's like, dude, I just want to tell you, um, everyone hated you. And I was just like, wow, uh, it's it's because I was the absentee founder. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that's what people wanted. And I could, like, that is like the most wrong. And I'll, I guess I'll just add on really quick. I thought that because I'm like a self-motivated person that I love learning that everyone else, like, I, I'm like, dude, I didn't do that well in school. I'm like, if I can figure it out, anybody can figure it out, right? I'm like, this is simple. People are like amazing, right? Um, but if they don't, if they don't own the business, if they're not incentivized, they will never care as much as you will. Hmm. That's what diversity should be in hiring, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that you have someone who is, they complete that circle of all the yeah. emotions we need, all the skills that we need, and yeah. you're reinforcing the value. Yeah. You mentioned when buying and selling agencies. Mm -hmm. What's like the average deal size you have when yeah. you're buying? So right now, I we look for smaller agencies probably doing anywhere from 500K to 1.5 million in profit. Um, A year? So, yeah. Yeah, and so they, these can be like probably top line three, four, or five million dollars or so. Um, and we want things that are additive to us. So, you know, for example, we don't do email marketing. We don't do, we don't do, um, we don't do like influencer marketing, for example. We want them to be additive or maybe there's like a global footprint where we can cross sell and upsell into their, their logos. 
Um, and so there, there needs to be multiple synergies and ideally we want to be able to keep the management team on because agencies are so people driven. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's like a lot of dynamics in our checklist, but, um, that's generally what we're, what we're looking for. Crazy. So these would be smaller deals. Yeah, yeah. But small, but still not that small because like with a company that's doing three or 4 million a year, they probably have 20 employees, 30 employees. Perhaps, yeah. It depends on what, like, if it's, like, all in Asia, you might have, like, 80 employees or something. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. But if it's the U.S., you might have, like, 15 or 20, yeah. Have you ever had any issues doing integration? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we <laughs> we definitely did. And this goes back to involvement again, because when we did the integrations, um, I wasn't as involved as I should have been. But there's this, you know, knot in my stomach where I'm like, I should, this doesn't feel right right now. Always act on your gut. That's one thing I'll say. Um, what happened was we did two agency acquisitions at basically the same time. And then we hired a GM and this person actually, um, ended up stealing from us. She stole, um, clients, she stole like employees. And, um, you know, she, you know, she said her, her, her brother was sick, which was true. And we put her on paid leave. We said, we love you. We got you go take care of that. Um, and then what happened afterwards was she actually told a lot of people that, oh my God, the company's growing, going down. You should, you know, join me or whatever. So she ended up taking a couple of people to this other agency. And then she tried to do the same thing to them. She had actually done the same thing to the previous agency before. So all that to say is like, had I been involved, had I been focused, had I been acting on my, the, the gut, by the way, the gut is your wisdom, right? That's your experience. Mm. Trust, like it's, it's more right often than, than, than not. Mm. I would say it's right. Like 90 plus percent of the time. Mm. Um, but I would say you know, those are kind of the lessons. Like, had I had I been involved, I think with those acquisitions, they would have worked out better. Um, but the answer to your question with the integrations is um, you got to be all over it. And ideally you're doing, you know, we got rushed by our broker. And by the way, I'm taking responsibility for all this. I'm not even going to blame the broker or the, the, the GM that we hired. Um, I would just say that you want to do probably, you know, four or five, six months of due diligence just to make sure it's a perfect fit. You're talking to their customers, you're talking to their key employees, um, before it, because that will set you up for a good integration. Mm. Well, what advice would you have for someone selling an agency? Yeah. So in what context? So someone's building an agency, they're probably at, let's say the 500 K profit uh -huh. a year yep. and they're looking to sell. Yep. How do you build a company to sell it? What are you looking for when you're looking to buy yep. on the flip side? Okay, I guess I'll start on the, the, the sales side. So let's say you start an agency, you get it to 500 grand in profit. Ideally, it's a service that's trending upwards. It's like influencers, community management, you know, everyone wants to do YouTube now, right? Um, so you got to look at, is there a good total addressable market for it? Mm. Um, and then ideally, you know, you are running on some type of operating system. So a lot of entrepreneurs know of Traction EOS, so entrepreneurs yep. operating system. There's also scaling up. Um, those are great because it's it's you're having systems and processes within your business and that makes it sellable. You want to build build a business to be sellable, not necessarily because you want to sell it, um, but because they know that they can operate it without you um, at the end of the day. Because it's just if it's just a, a a shit storm and it's all ran by the founder, well, guess what? They're going to be keeping you on for the next couple of years or so. But if if you can prove that this thing can run without you, then you are going to it's going to be an easier earnout for you. Maybe you can leave earlier. Um, but I would say like, you know, yes, build it to sell mostly because of the processes and the systems, but ideally you're not trying to sell the thing. Ideally you're building for the long term for your growth. And then eventually someone might come to you because when you least expect it, like one of my friends that lives nearby, um, he tried to sell his company in 2020, nobody wanted to buy it. And then all of a sudden, like recently he got an offer, like a really amazing offer. You just don't know what's going to happen. And if it seems amazing, then you just take it. So. Was it you that mentioned that you should be cash flowing every year from your business as if it's a sale? Yeah. So you should have an exit every single year. So my friend Syed and I were talking about this. He has like a bunch of WordPress companies and he has, he's like, why do I need to sell my company? I have an exit every single year. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, let's, let's say your agency is doing like, you know, a million, two million, three million a year in profit. That's a good chunk of money. And you can get, get, get up to 5 million, 10 million a year in profit. That's an exit every single year. Some people don't even see that in their lifetimes, right? A lot of people don't. Um, and then, okay, if you get it to 5 million in profit, then that agency, the, the multiple can go up to 10, 15 X or so. So let's say it goes up to $50 million or so, right? Or you get it to 10 X, maybe it goes up to, you can sell it for a hundred or 150 million or so, right? Whoa. It gets crazy. How, how do those multiples work, work? Because like the, the common knowledge in agency space is one, the multiples are low. Uh -huh. And then two, just to scale yep. is really tough. Uh -huh. So like, how do you, how do you think about that? Cause you're someone who's actually done it, right? Yeah. So usually with agencies, if you're doing like 500K in profit, you might be able to sell for like one or two X on profit, right? Um, or if you get it to a million or so, maybe you can sell it for two, three, four X, right? Yeah. Which is what, what you usually hear. 
but you start to get to scale it. Let's say you get it to like uh, 3 million in profit. You can start to sell it for a higher multiple, 7X or so, because you're actually building a system around it, right? You get to 5 million, you, you can actually build a platform around it, mean, meaning that you can acquire that business and then buy other agencies and roll it in for multiple arbitrage, which I'm happy to explain in a second. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you get to 5 million, the reason why people are willing to pay more is because there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of infrastructure built in, there's a lot of talent, there's a strong management team, mm -hmm. there's a lot less risk for these uh, private equity shops that are partnered with agencies um, that are trying to do a deal. When you're 500K, there's a lot more risk. There's key man risk. Even at a million, it's still a key man risk. Mm. Um, and then to, to your second question, why why don't most people do it? It's because they they run into problems around, it's a lot of people issues. And I just can't <laughs> deal with it anymore. Oh my God, the headaches, right? They tap out. And um, sell courses. Yeah, yeah. They start selling <laughs> courses. They start, but I don't, I don't poo poo on this, but they start, start selling courses. Maybe they, you know, pivot into like agency coaching or whatever, which is fine. Um, but it also means that, you know, there was a mountain for them to conquer, but they didn't want to summit that mountain, which is fine. Mm. What do you think about when people say that they closed their agency because it was too difficult to sell? I think it's total bullshit. <laughs> total bullshit. Yeah. Same. Yeah, it's, it's total bullshit. I, I closed. My, no, it's because you weren't competent enough to grow it. Well, That's you're it. also not making money, though, because yeah. like I know uh, you, were you familiar with Jordan Platten. No, really big SMA agency guy in yeah. in the UK. Yeah, and uh, he's an ed education business around SMA as well. Yep. but he still kept the agency, and uh -huh. the agency is doing like 115k a month now. Right. It's a huge leadership team yeah. and everything, and he's focused on other business. But he was telling me about other guys in the space uh, who are doing different stuff now. Yeah, but the guys who are really crushing it still have the agency mm -hmm. in the portfolio, mm -hmm. and again, they've worked out getting a CEO and stuff involved. Yeah. And they're like, he said to me completely br brutally honest, he was like, if you were making 100K a month, why the fuck would you ever close that business yeah. if it actually worked? Exactly. But most people's businesses yeah. never work and they yep. learn the basics of just client acquisition, yep. delivery, fulfillment, and then make a course of it. Do you want to know how we book the most amazing guests on our podcast like you're seeing today? I've created a full template and guide and every single script that I've ever used to get the best guests in the world and I've put everything together in a simple step-by-step -step process. If you click the link down below, I'll give you the exact guide to book any guests on your podcast and I have a full guest management system for you to manage every single guest. If you want to see the process behind booking guests like Justin Waller, Luke Belmar, Sterling Cooper, and every guest in the online business space, click the link down below and you'll get the full guide for free. Thank you. Yeah, well, the thing <laughs> is they, they will acquire clients, right? And then they'll churn them out. For, their churn's just too high, so you can't really scale it. Because if you're churning like 5% of your revenue per month, you need to replace 50% of it at the end of the year, right? It's actually more than 50%. Um, and so that's a big problem. People, especially in the internet marketing, the digital space, people don't think about client retention. They don't think about service. They don't think about churn, right? That's a big problem. Because if you can, you keep the churn low and you have, you know, um, net revenue expansion, you can have, um, in SaaS, we call this net dollar retention. Um, that can actually be your expansion revenue, your upsells, cross-sells actually outpace everything right mm. and you're just growing like a weed because you have multiple services that are complementary people don't want to churn because you have to, you have so many things built in right mm. um, even though another agency might be better at like one thing you, you can do multiple things pretty well and so does that affect the sale though um a lot of times so people might come to us for example we, we do a lot of seo work and not a lot of agencies do seo right and so they'll come to us for seo and that's kind of the gateway drug and once we start looking at their stuff, we're like, well, let's take a look at your ad account too. What's going on over here, right? And we start to uncover more and more stuff. And then they're like, okay, yeah, you guys sound like you're smart. Okay, go ahead and do this. And so you basically, in, in large agencies, you do, you do a lot of landing, landing and expanding. So you might work with Coca-Cola Brazil for like $3,000 a month, right? Might not seem like a lot of money. But what happens is you start to do good work. It start, the account starts to grow more and more in Brazil. And they're like, hey, let's give you a shot for like pitching in, you know, all of LATAM, right? And it gets bigger. It's like, okay, let's give you a shot in North America. Boom, right? So that's how these accounts become $3,000 a month to multi-seven or eight figures a year. Damn, man. Yeah, because I've noticed that ourselves. So we're trying to get people in the door uh -huh. and then we build offers on the back end and that's where we're making the asymmetrical returns, yep. right? Because a lot of them are, some companies are doing 4 million a year. Mm -hmm. We'd come in, add a 1 million a year yeah. offer, you know, yeah. and so on and so forth. Yep. I didn't think of it from that perspective though, like geo expansion. Yeah. Yeah, but by the way, I, I wanted to back up a second. You, you talked about, okay, you, you have an agency doing 100K a month, 200K a month. Like, why would you shut it down? Absolutely, like, it's stupid, right? So, okay, people that are, you know, creating content are like, We're, I shut down my agency and decided to do this. Okay, that's BS. And then the second piece <laughs> is um, the people that are hiring CEOs, right? I guarantee you, 
most of those companies that have hired CEOs aren't growing as fast as they used to with the, the founder involved, right? Again, going back to focus involvement, there are a lot of people on, on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, that talk about building a holding company and hiring a CEO and getting out of their way. It does not work like that, right? Like I've tried that, by the way, multiple times, multiple, multiple times. Um, again, who has the most incentive? You, the owner. And if you can create good incentives for the CEO still, you might give them 5%, 10% in equity, maybe 15 20%. They are still not going to care as much as you will. You still need to be, you need to trust, but verify. I'm not saying you need to micromanage, but you need to trust, but verify. Mm. It's like, who's done that really well in the space? So Alex Lieberman has been trying to do that for quite some time. For? For that portfolio holding company. Mm -hmm. Greg Eisenberg has been doing it. Yeah. Uh, Hunter Hammond. I would argue that, okay, let, let's use, um, Let's use Neil again as an example with his agency, right? So, and actually at Handful, I was at a dinner yesterday. One guy sold his agency for about $160 million. Um, and so I know a handful of agency owners that are that are doing, you know, around that range. And they're just focused on that. Um, they're not focused on a holding company. Or whatever. They might be buying agencies and rolling them in and mm -hmm. integrating them. And, and that's about it. But that's the platform, right? Um, I would say the people that you mentioned, I, I, I think... Um, they do pretty well, which is fine, right? But they don't do as well as these people that are very uh, focused, right? And when I say well, they're all doing well personally. I'm just saying like in terms of like scale for the business, right? Mm. So it just depends on what you want. I think it's like, okay, um, if you want to build something, maybe five, 10, 15, 20 million dollars a year, amazing for yourself, right? Um, but if you want to swing for the fences, you tend to see like Tenuity, for example, that's an agency. Um, there's, um, you know, there's W Promote, they sold for a good chunk of change, right? Well, multi nine figures. Mm. Um, and then power digital, um, kind of same, same type of outcome. So, you know, those guys were just laser focused on one thing. Mm. With the portfolio company, it seems like you're just learning new business models continuously and just going in different directions. All right. It's going yeah. back to the Sam Owens approach. So just the laser yeah. focus versus yeah. going out. You know, it just seems like very difficult to do any type of scale. With yeah. That. I think to me, that's, um, that, that is, and I, I've had this problem before. I had to get punched in the face a couple of times to learn it. So I'm not immune to this, right? Yeah. And I, I, I easily find myself gravitating back into like, I want to do all these things, right? Um, I'm intellectually promiscuous, right? So like the shiny object syndrome, shiny knowledge syndrome, shiny knowledge syndrome leads to shiny object syndrome. Mm. And I think, you know, I have friends on Twitter that make fun of the holding company model. It's like, like one guy, um, his name's Matt Paulson. He just runs an email newsletter and they do like $40 million a year. He's like, yep. You know, I'm gonna go teach uh, kids next couple next couple weeks in South Dakota. I'm gonna tell them why it doesn't make sense to run a, a holding company. Mm. All he does is make funny holding companies, right? Yeah. So, hmm. again, they're viable, but all these people that you mentioned, like I'm, I'm friends with Greg, I'm friends with with Alex Lieberman, right? I think they're 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 amazing people. Um, I think, including for people like myself, have we, have we just focused earlier? It would have been better. And I keep, I hated this before when people told me in my twenties, like. I read these books, I'd hear from people, yeah, you know, you need to focus, focus, yeah, Bill Gates focus, yeah, mm. uh, Warren Buffett focus. And I'm just like, but, 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 but like, I'm different. Mm. No, you're not different. <laughs> no. History repeats itself, right? Yeah. Tell me about the Yahoo and Facebook story. Yeah. So with Facebook, so Yahoo wanted to acquire Facebook for a billion at the time, and they were heavily unprofitable. They weren't making a lot of money. And um, Peter Thiel, who wrote the book Zero to One, he was one of the main board members, main investors for a, a Facebook. And so they had to, from this offer, they had to have a board meeting, right? So Mark Zuckerberg, you know, Peter Thiel, um, you know, he's in the meeting room and he's talking to the other investors and they're like, yeah, we should probably think about taking this deal, right? Um, and so Mark Zuckerberg walks in and then Peter Thiel's like, we should take the deal, right? And then Mark's like, you know, um, I think it's gonna be a quick call, probably 10 minutes or so. Um, we're not gonna take the deal. And, uh, and Peter's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, dude, you're going to get $250 million from this. And you're like in your early twenties right now. Um, and like, that's a good outcome. And then we're going to get a good outcome too. You should really think about this. And Mark's like, well, no, because one, I wouldn't know what to do with $250 million. Two, if I were to sell, I'd probably want to go build another social network. And I kind of like the one that I have already. So why would I, why would I sell? Right. Mm -hmm. And that proved out to be a, a very prescient decision. And I think 99.9% .9 of people would have sold, but he stuck to his values and um, people respect him for that. And now it's a multi, I think they're, they're over a trillion, multi-trillion dollar company or mm. close to it. Yeah. What's the lesson there? The lesson there is one, you got to stick to your values. And two, if you love what you're doing already, then you're not, 
you wouldn't let outside influences control you. You have your board trying to control you there. You have money, you know, people's money like Yahoo trying to influence you. Mm. Um, but when you're so set on what you stand for and what you're trying to do long term, mm. you can block all the outside influences out. Right. And that matters a lot. Like we talked about this on the podcast recently in marketing school. It's like, dude, you take on VC, you take on investors, um, you give you, you're, you're maybe your employees have equity. That's all fine, by the way. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just understand that you have other stakeholders and they will influence you. And um, there's this book I'm reading right now where they talk about pendulums, right? Like if you drink alcohol, you're, you're part of that you know, community and they'll influence you too, right? Um, if you go do yoga or whatever, that, that's a community. Maybe that's a good community, right? But there's outside influences everywhere trying to control you. Um, and the more you can kind of you know, stick true to your values, then you'll probably make better decisions for the long term. Mm, especially as you evolve, I guess, as you get older, right? Because your interests have probably evolved, mm -hmm. but they're your interests though yeah. versus the typical co-founder relationship that when they get in their thirties, they get married and then yeah. like the wife wants them to sell the business yeah, yeah, yeah. and then it all cr crumbles yeah, well, there, the, the, right? What, the spouse is a major influence as well. But like yeah. everything though, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's so interesting is the fact that people don't, people aren't playing an infinite game. They're not looking at long enough time horizon. So that when these things play out, it's a shit show. Yeah. And that's why sometimes you got to make the better decision to not get involved mm -hmm. with those people. Yep. Whether it's a, a friend, yep. um, a partner, whatever. Looking at over the long enough time horizon, when things go yep. south, yeah. that will happen. Yep. Question for you on that, like personally. So, you know, you were like the gamer dude when you were mm -hmm. a kid and you had maybe a social circle. How has that kind of evolved yourself personally? Like your interests have changed over your 20s and 30s. And yeah. do you, have you found yourself to be like, you know, you've a new set of, set of friend group and yeah. you acting kind of, I don't know, like I'm trying to say, was there any kind of negative side to as you've grown the business in terms of, who's come into your circle, yeah. who's taken stuff from you and yeah. lost friends. You know, what I will say, so I guess two things that you mentioned a lot, the, the lost friends thing, that, that that's an interesting one. Um, so I would just say the one thing, and I've thought about this recently with gaming, ever since I was like um, maybe even eight or nine years old, the main thing that stuck out to me is like, if you want to do big things, you need to join a team and not just any team, you need to join an amazing team. Mm -hmm. So in every game, I was always like World of Warcraft. I always made sure I was part of the Uber guild, the, the best guild, right? The best team. Cause you got to kill the best dragons, right? And when you, when you had to compete with like, you know, the horde, right? Um, you would do hardcore things. Like, you know, your guild leader would call you at 3 a.m. and wake everybody up like 40, 50 people just to make sure that the other team couldn't kill a dragon. And we would stomp on them until 6 a.m. until they, they, they gave up and then we'd kill the dragon, right? Mm. That's like hardcore, right? <laughs> but you have to do that in business too. You gotta be hardcore. You gotta go like the extra mile. Um, and in EverQuest too, right? Like you know, it's, I was part of the best guild and like, that's how I got like the best loot and everything. Right. Um, and so even in business, you got to be a part of the best team. So, um, you know, put the best team together or like, you got to be a part of the best community. Right. Um, for me, I'm like, okay, got to research, like who's the best coach I can work with. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so to me, it's, everything's a people game at the end of the day. And I think I realized that, that at an early age. So that's always kind of stuck with me. The thing I'll say about, um, friendship and my, my mom tells me this too. I have, I had some friends from elementary school. Um, I had one, one that lives nearby, actually like a block away from here. And I was messaging him for lunch, but like, we still keep in touch. The reason for that is because he's an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. We came from like nothing. And, you know, we had good family lives. It's, I, I think, you know, upper middle class, I'd say for both of us. Um, and so there's no judgment there because he knows what it feels like to almost miss payroll, to almost have to bankrupt your company, to have to go through all the struggle of being an entrepreneur. So there's no judgment from his side. And then you have your other friends, um, who will never judge you, right? Like they might not be entrepreneurs, but they love you for who you are and they'll always stay in touch with you. Like I have a you know best friend, he he FaceTimes me every day. We FaceTime each other every hmm. day, right? Um, and like, there's no judgment and we just talk about whatever. Um, but, you know, if you end up starting something and like for me, I've always came from like, I was kind of like, you know, hung out with cool people and everything, right? But I was always kind of lower tier. Hmm. You start to rise up the ranks and you start to notice that, oh, you know what? Um, they don't like to hang out with you anymore. Mm. because your your habits are changing you're becoming a different person and you start to hold up a mirror to them it's like oh like you could have done this stuff too because if eric can do it like that guy had nothing going for him before if eric can figure it out like but, but why can't i do it right mm. and so it's it's no knock i think it's no knock on, on anybody in particular i just think it's human nature and my mom tells me this too she's like Yep, she saw this, like I had a, I have a rich uncle. She's like, I saw this with your rich uncle. Everyone, like a lot of people started to get jealous and started to dislike him, but you just have to be okay with that because mm -hmm. um, this, like the cycle we see in the world right now, there's, there's a lot, Charlie Munger says that it's not greed that drives human beings, it's actually envy and you just have to be very careful. So it's actually better to be rich and anonymous than rich and famous. 
but if you think of your scenario, like you're a nice dude, like you're like super chill and yeah. like just a well, nice guy. It's not like you're online shitting on nine to five people and yeah. so on. So yeah. if you were that person, mm -hmm. you could see how people like would literally hate you. Oh, totally. As a result. Yeah. And that reflection, like people, of course, uh, aggravated, they put in the knife and they turn the knife deliberately. But for someone like you, who's just like a nice chill guy who likes video games, yeah. <laughs> has built these huge businesses. Yeah. To see someone like have envy and jealousy and yeah. I don't know anything more negative, it's just kind of unfortunate. Yeah, it, it is unfortunate, but I, ju I just think it's human nature because I certainly felt like when I was younger, I was definitely jealous and yeah. like how do, how do these people have these things and I don't, right? I think it's just human nature. Um, so like I I'm very understanding about it. And then this is also interesting too. I was I was at a dinner. Um, two YouTubers there. One guy's name is George Gammon, um, and then Mark Moss, and they have you know they get millions of views per month, right? And I'm like, Eric, like you should see more polarizing things, like what you actually think, right? About things. And I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense. But it's like, oh my God, you would get so many more views. I'm like, it doesn't make sense because if I actually talk about some some things that are polarizing, um, it's not even like clients might churn or whatever. It's more so it polarizes my employee base. And mm. it, it sows division in that. And that makes it very difficult to run a company. That That's why mm. it's not worth it to, to talk about polarizing things for me. And, but you also don't need to be. So I'm quite similar to you in that regard. Like the typical advice of that is create an avatar if you want, split the audience, throw stones at everyone who's yep. not in there. Uh -huh. The religion is, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyone who's not in the religion yep, yeah, yeah. is outside the religion. Yep. And that's what some of the best YouTubers have done. It's what Tate did. And mm -hmm. they built up a huge following, cult, yep. effectively. Mm -hmm. He read 48 Laws of Power. Yep. It's literally about how to make a cult. Mm -hmm. My argument is, if my camp was so good, why don't we just promote my camp mm -hmm. and just talk about how great our camp is, yep. and then that's it, yep. you know? And then we'll pull in the right people and we'll leave people outside it, outside it, but we're not shitting on people outside mm -hmm. it. It's just a small frame change, yep. but that's how you build much more of like um, an elegant brand. Yeah. And I think like yep. your customer is a reflection of you, so I could probably right. look at your customer base, the yep. executives that are there, and they probably emulate your values, mm -hmm. which are not like, again, people yep. throwing stones, right? By the way, I, to, to your point, I, just to give some examples for people, I guess, you look at a, like a Gary Vee, for example, like he, he doesn't have nearly as many views as he used to, but he's still relevant. And he's just a very nice, kind person. And he's also like kind of rough around the edges, like New York Jets, right? You know, yeah. you know, um, and you know, he'll cuss and people don't like that, right? That might polarize people a little bit. It doesn't polarize me, but um, he does have people that are, they, they love him for him. You, you mentioned Hormozzi, same deal, right? Like he's just, he's a genuinely good person. Um, and so you can build a brand that way, but you, you also like, I think for both of them, they do have a point of view, yeah, um, where like, sure. you know, they'll, they'll put their foot down, but it's, it's nothing like, Oh, you know, talking about like, um, you know, being Republican or Democrat or anything like that. Yeah. And that's exactly it. So your views can just be your view. It doesn't need to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be violent. And like, I actually speak with this with all of our clients is that we need to believe what we believe in. Um, Sean Hanna from Genflow says to me, you have to be about it. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm the podcast guy. I truly believe in podcasting is a great way to connect to people. It's this anti, like we don't socialize anymore. It's bringing it back to natural. I generally believe that that's true. Yeah. So I talk about that and it's just a strong value and a strong point of mine. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be negative on the other side, right? right? But again, it's almost like a reflection. Um, so I want to ask about, so you said you were kind of insecure when you're younger, you know, you were more introverted and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then people like Hermosi is more, he mentions about how he's insecure as well, but where he was growing up. Do you think that's like a good, it's good when you channel it in the right way? I love it. I mean, it's, um, so I, I've appreciate the, so when you have insecurity combined with ambition, it's a great combo, Yeah. right? Um, and so, you know, I think Hormozzi definitely had that, um, you know, and he can speak to it, but he, he's, he's mentioned it, right? It's like, you know, for him, um, well, we won't even talk about him. I guess I'll just talk about me. I think for me growing up, um, the ambition piece came from the, the gaming um, and the ambition also came from like, you know, you see your parents fight about money sometimes, like you don't want to fight about that anymore. And then also you see like um, insecurity, like you hear from like your friends, oh, like you're not quite at their level. You hear that from your parents mm. and all that. Like it is a chip on your shoulder. And um, I do believe we're all programmed from our childhoods. And so I'm glad I still have that chip, right? I don't think it ever quite goes away. Mm. Um, and so it, it, it keeps me motivated. Yeah, I enjoy it. Mm. Yeah. But you kind of have an, an element of humility too, right? Yeah. That I think it's an interesting, uh, I talk about this quite a lot, how I find it quite strange when I see someone make more and more money and become more ego driven. Yeah. Whereas for me, the more money that I've earned, I've become less ego driven because yeah. I realize I don't know anything. Well, I yeah, I mean, money is an <laughs> amplifier of who you actually are at mm. the end of the day. So like, um, I thought like if I would make more money, I would want like 
a Lamborghini or like, you know, all these possessions. And like, I actually don't care about those things, right? Like, <laughs> I don't wear a really nice watch or anything like that. Yeah. Right? I might have an aura ring, like, and I, I don't even like wearing stuff. So. An Apple watch? Yeah. So, dude, I am, um, I got, um, well, what even is, you know, Jeep, the brand, mm -hmm. uh, the Rubicon. I wanted to buy it, right? It's so stupid and so expensive. And um, my wife, my mother in law said to me, she was like, just rent it for a month. And if you rent it and you still love it after yeah. you rent it, then you can buy it, mm -hmm. whatever. And I was like, okay, cool. Got it. Seven days later, I was like, I fucking hate You're this. You're over thing. it. Yeah. Right? yeah. I, I would come out of my, my house every day. I'd walk past it to my motorbike, yeah. which is just like a, a shitty old motorbike. Yeah. And every single day, the car was matte black. Yeah. It would just get dustier and dustier. I yeah. walked past the thing. I was like, oh my God, get rid yeah. of it. Yeah. I rang the guy to take it back. And he was like, dude, I'm not taking it back. He was like, you have to live out the 30 days at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my, I genuinely yeah. could not look at the thing anymore. Yeah. I drove it around four more times after that. I handed back the keys and I was like, yeah. fuck this. Because it got to the point where I was like, yeah. I don't even want to bring it out in case yeah. I tip it and yeah. I get I mark it. Yeah. And I handed it back and I was like, sometimes you need to experience it. And like, yeah. I'm susceptible to everything, right? I'm not yeah. talking from like a high perspective. Yeah. And I guess, because I thought to myself, oh, it's more practical. It's not like a watch, right? Mm -hmm. Watches hold a value, yeah. whatever, but it's not like a watch. Yeah. I thought I could use it. And I was like, I fucking hate this. You know what's interesting? <laughs> I mean, you look at people's Instagrams and the people that have purpose aren't posting about um, kind of material possessions. Mm -hmm. And if you like material possessions, like that's fine. But I, I just generally, like the pattern that I've seen is if you have a sense of purpose, like you're not posting about that stuff, that f stuff falls way below. You're not posting that you're flying on a first class, you know, flight. Um, you know, you got this Lamborghini or whatever, or you're like you're, you're, you're popping bottles. That's stuff in your 20s, but like you realize later in your life that, um, you know, what is it? Family's number one, right? And then you can talk mm. about like, maybe there's business teachings or religious teachings or whatever it is exactly. But purpose to me is just serving other people. Mm. And, um, you know, when you're posting material things, you're, you're really talking about serving yourself. Mm. it's also the optics mm -hmm. how we want our audience or our customers yeah. to perceive us yeah sam ovens is a good example of that you know skyrise back in the day yeah the blue suit and yeah. now he's just chilling with long hair yeah. and it was never him and he's admitted it that like that wasn't me but he was trying to sell a certain perception to people and he was playing into human psychology yeah mm. so that more emotive side that kind of connecting with your audience or connecting with your people so you know you mentioned gary v and he has the videos about his mom and shit but then you have people like chris chris though who mm -hmm. I'm chatting with tomorrow and he does a really nice balance here because he takes about, he think he thinks about it through the lens of internal. Yeah. It's the internal state. Yeah. And you then, should talk to him about Gary Vee tomorrow. I will. I yeah, watched yeah, your yeah. clip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I listened to your podcast for yeah. both of you together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's interesting, right? Because he's he's done the work internally. Mm -hmm. And then as a result, that becomes who he's about. Yeah. People love him. Mm -hmm. People go to his masterminds yeah. and his workshops and yeah. so on and so forth. Yep. Because the energy that you, this may seem woo woo, but it's not though. It's like the yep. energy that you emit is the energy yep. you receive. He's a perfect example of someone that understands what he wants to build. He understands his values. He doesn't want to necessarily build a big agency. He's like, okay, I just want to focus on educating. So he did, the, did these like workshops, right? He came to my mastermind where Sam Ovens was there and we, we had a speaker's dinner mm. and um, I actually sat him next to Sam. And Sam had this section over there. He's just telling everyone, like, you got to start a mastermind, right? You got to start a mastermind. <laughs> and that's how Chris eventually, he started his mastermind. Um, but it works out well for him because he loves learning. He loves teaching. And he doesn't, he's a type of guy, like he used to do, back when Clubhouse was a thing, um, he would be in these rooms and he'd host these rooms with thousands of people, right? And, um, you know, he'd bring people up. And then as soon as he found someone being insufferable, he's like, I can't stand you anymore. He was like, mute you or whatever, right? I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. But he's just really direct. And, yeah. um, you know, building a, a huge team or whatever, that's just not what he wants anymore. He, maybe he doesn't want people problems, but he is, you can see he's living within his values mm. and it really comes out. Yeah, he's called me out on my shit sometimes on a podcast before. Yeah. Can't remember what it was around. It could have been around sales or actually this was it. I asked him, how does someone like build, how does someone kind of build authority and influence if they don't have experience? Are they kind of living through like an optic lens? Uh -huh. And I forget what I actually said about my opinion on it, but he was like, it's not, he's like, that's not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's good, right? It's yeah. it's good to be open and honest because then you respect the person as a result. Yep. And you have much more of a, it's just real. Mm -hmm. And like people just fucking aren't real. Yeah. yeah the word <laughs> like Gary Vee's authentic, Christo's authentic, right? It's like there's a lot of these people where you can, you can feel it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And they're also not afraid to be wrong in yep. that regard. Yep. How do you run your mastermind events how do you yeah. do that 
So I have a mastermind called Leveling Up. This year we're, we're, we didn't do it because I'm focused on, I'm running the YPO Global Marketing Summit and that's a whole ordeal in itself. And mm -hmm. so, um, but that mastermind, which I've done for a couple of years, um, the way that's structured, it's like, you know, the last one we had in Beverly Hills was maybe, I want to say 110 people or so. So it's like a decent, decent size, but um, everyone's doing average is probably eight figures in revenue and you have business owners from, from different areas, not just wow. agency people, but you have, you have agency people, you have product people, you have e-commerce people, um, SaaS people as well. And, um, you know, for me, it's my way of gathering people together. So I pick the location, I pick the speakers, mm. you know, I vet every single person that comes through. I get to decide when it ends. I could decide what the agenda is. I'm an, I'm an extroverted introvert, right? So mm. I'll set it all up. It's, it's like my experience, like, and, um, from that, you know, that's like a two day thing. And after that, like I'm good. Right. Mm. And, um, I, I get my share of learnings. I get my share of networking. And, um, that's not an event that we try to necessarily make money on, but everyone's like, Oh my God, that's like the best event I've been to best event I've been to. Right. Um, and I'm appreciative of that, but, um, I don't want to make it into a business. Mm. I can make it into a business, but then I have to, that's another thing I have to worry about. So, um, that's generally how I structure these types of events. And we'll probably do something similar for the, the agency group. Mm. Um, and there's already a lot of them like that, but I'll just follow my format. So, so yeah, so a hundred entrepreneurs at eight figures, mm -hmm. it's pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some at nine figures, right. Some, you know, multi-billion dollar companies. So yeah. So you've basically found a way to disqualify people underneath. So you don't want to have in a, in a sphere, but then also bring in the right audience. How do you sell that? Like what do you price it at? Yeah. So that one price is at 25 grand. Um, and typically, yeah, it's one event for the year. It used to be more, um, but I just want to make it simple. Yeah. And, um, you know, we'd have, we'd get people on phone calls. So we used to run podcast ads towards it. Um, and we, we, we'd send emails to people and, um, yeah, it'd be a phone call. And then if they're down to come, great. If not, then, you know, whatever. So. Yeah. 25 K that seems so reasonable because of like who you're actually going to have in the audience, right? Mm -hmm. who you're going to, be able to bring people in. Yep. Do you think that there's an opportunity for you to move into like the coaching space? Mm, I would say for us, no, I need it. I, Cause for me, I'm focused on operating the agency. Um, okay. and so the same thing with Neil, he's focused on operating, he's focused on doing, uh, driving traffic, doing deals. I'm, I'm kind of the same way. Um, but I, I am more operational within the business and, um, yeah, that sh cause the thing is if I'm focused on coaching, that's going to take up a lot of my time. Yeah. Um, that being said though, with the agency group that we have, Neil and I will appear every couple weeks or so, and we will actually do a group coaching yeah. session. And then we'll publish that to marketing school because those kind of serve as ads as well. Yep. People are like, oh my God, that sounds really good. I want to do it. Yeah. It, it's a long VSL, right? Yeah. And we, we do one once a month. And that actually gets a podcast recording session out of the way as well. Well, it's it's just so easy to do basically to build that ecosystem because yeah. when you're basically sharing wisdom. That's mm -hmm. it. You know, so yep. it's easy to do because you spend 20 years learning the yep. thing. But at the end of the day, though, it's just a weekly call on a Wednesday, yeah. a Slack chat, yeah. and that's it. If you compare yeah. that to an agency, how difficult an agency is yeah. to run, right? Yeah. So it's all about, it's all about the insight. Yep. Yep. And I love Chris's approach to that where he does, and are you familiar with this, but he does like a hot seat. No. Approach. Oh, this is really interesting. We did this in our coaching program today mm -hmm. because of, I think I'm going to tell Chris tomorrow yeah. as well. His approach is instead of just, so you have the content that you're kind of indoctrinating and getting people to go through in a linear way so that they're mm -hmm. in your wavelength. But Chris's approach is that on his weekly calls, he does like a hot seat. So he'd pick your business mm -hmm. or your design business, for, for instance. And you'd come in and say, I'm having this problem on client acquisition and delivery and my pricing's off. Yep. And he'll go through and whiteboard it. Yep. And then as a result, 40, 50, 100 people are in the call or whatever. And then they're also, guess what? They have the same problems. Mm -hmm. So they're learning through that model. Yep. And we started just doing that today, just a bit of a, bit of a change this morning at 6 a.m. And... People loved it yeah. because everyone's problems are the same, right? As long as they're around the same level. The the problem with with like a group like ours is like you have to segment out the six figure people and the seven figure people and the eight figure people because yeah. they have different problems. Um, but yeah, the the hot seat model, like in in uh, EO or YPO, we call this uh, forum where there's a presentation. Um, so for for example, today I'm I'm doing like a meeting. It's like a seven hour meeting. Um, seven but hours. <laughs> but like you know, you might come with like one of your core issues, and then we'll all just you know we'll hear about it, and then we'll experience share, right? That kind of is a hot seat situation. Mm. Um, so yeah, hot seats work really well as long as people are at the same level. Because if you have someone with an eight figure problem, and then the group's all six figure people, it's not going to land. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And that's when I think it's interesting to hear that there's eight figure people in that because I would assume that they want one to one care because mm -hmm. they're at that stage, right? Yeah. They're less 
how do I get leads? Yeah. And more like my close rate is only at 19% than it should be at 40 or something, mm-hmm. right? Does that make sense? Yep. It's almost like solving the problem in different ways depending on where someone is mm-hmm. in their journey. Tell me more about your setup. So I've seen that you've mentioned before about, you know, how taking time off work and letting ideas come in. Like how do you balance doing versus thinking? Yeah, so right now... Um, you know, for example, I went to Italy this summer. That was like a 12 day thing. And I just totally dis- I was like mostly disconnected. I would check Slack every now and then. Um, but that gave me a lot of space. And it wasn't like I was trying to think through things every day. Like I'll just because there's that space, there's not that pressure. Um, you know, the mind clears up quite a bit. You're not in a day to day. You're not in the trenches kind of like, you know, fighting through things. Right. I think that's really valuable but because when you come back, you're super refreshed mm. um, and you'll, you'll often come back with like a lot of ideas, which might scare your team sometimes, too. Um, but you know, I'm like, okay, well, that worked out well. I should do more of that. And this is interesting because the founder of LMNT, the Salt, yep. um, they he's been doing this for two, three years, I think. And it's a, it's basically a three week sprint and then one week off per month. And so it's three one, three one, three one, and he just he just does that, right? And that's not necessarily saying he's going on a vacation, but he might take like three, four days off, and he starts to like look at how the sprints went in the last, you know, three weeks or so and then prepare for the next three week sprints. Mm. And um, that seems like it's working well for him. And for me, I'm like, okay, how can I do that once a quarter or so? And I think Sam Ovens actually does this too. Once a quarter or so, he has like a one week break. Um, I think it's, you know, sometimes you, you you know, Naval Ravikant likes to say that you, you I think you sleep like a lion, right? And you hunt like one. Um, so lions sleep quite a bit, right? But when they're on, they're on. Mm. So, yeah. Did you ever find yourself getting a bit more anxious from being away? from work because like things build and they compound right so problems when the team sucks yes Mm. when the team's good like if you want to see how good your team is go on a vacation you go on a vacation you see which fires pop up you see if they're texting you calling you or whatever um but you know this past one there were no issues Mm. there are no issues and the team's gotten a lot better and here uh, talking about focused involvement again the number one thing, in my opinion, to get involved with is is hiring, right? Maybe you're not screening everyone, but maybe you're early in the process. You're meeting the first hundred people or so um, because that first hundred people, they set the tone for the company. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if you decide to del- like I've done this in the past, like where I would sit at the very end and I would feel bad because they've met so many people already. We were hiring just to fill seats. And what ended up happening was not a cultural fit and they would pollute the culture. Yeah. Um, not saying they were bad people, but they just weren't fits, right? And so... You know, they're not a fit. They, they're, realizing, they're realizing they're not a fit, but then then they start to cause problems to them because they're disgruntled, right? Mm. They, then they also don't want to leave either because this is their security, right? And also, they're not that good either, so it's hard for them to find another job. And then also, you know, the A players are watching them. It's like, oh, we're tolerating these C players. Um, also, they have to do the work for the C players. It's a compounding effect. And that's why, again, I go back to that 60-day moving average. It's mm. got to be kept, kept extremely high, mm. unreasonably high. And people on the team are not going to hate you for it, they're going to be annoyed at you, but in the long run, they're going to appreciate the fact that you kept the bar unreasonably high. Mm. How do you do that, though, specifically? Is that more true calls? Is that more true leading with examples? Yeah. So a couple of things. I mean, let, let's say I'm showing up to the you know second or third interview. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, on, like, what have they done that's exemplary, right? And so, you know, tell me something that made you stand out uh, as a teenager, right? Mm-hmm. Like, for example, for me, I sold like, you know, in-game armor and helmets for $3,000 in eighth grade, right? Like, that's something that's remarkable. How did you do that? Um, I played poker, you know, um, like 14, 15 hours a day in college, right? Like, well, okay, tell me more about that. Like, it's yeah. got to be like, they got, they got a little something that's off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but then also tell me like your most impressive win as it relates to this role, right? And then you start to really peel the onion. It's like, okay, so you said you built this thing over here. Oh, it turns out they're part of a team. Okay, tell me about that team. Oh, you're actually like, you know, a mid-level person on that team. Oh, so you actually didn't really build that thing, right? Mm. Um, it starts to unravel very quickly. And then you're just trying to see, you know, for us, it's like, is this person improved and obsessed? Is this person reliable? Are they open-minded? And we, that, those are our core values. Mm. And if you're not feeling it, usually you can feel it within the first five to 10 minutes or so, like this person's got it. Um, you probably shouldn't make the move. And like, you know, is this person smarter than you? Would you work for this person? Um, would you admire this person? Like these things all matter. Mm. And again, nobody's going to care as much as you, the founder. Hmm. You're, you're, um, you've interviewed Eamon Al-Abdul, yep. have you? He has a very interesting um, approach towards hiring about would you, one, be jealous or envious if they went to a competitor? Mm-hmm. And the second is, could you get on a 12-hour flight with them? Yeah, I, I like the first <laughs> one. The 12-hour the flight thing, you know, I don't know, you just like, I, I've sat on, 
long flights with people on my team. It's, it's all right. But I, I think the first one's good. Like it's, um, it, it's, it's almost similar to like, you know, uh, how indifferent would you feel if this person left? Right. Yeah. Like that's the question that we ask. And so it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good heuristic. The problem with the question too, is during an interview process, that particular one is you don't really know the person that well. Exactly. Yeah. Some people that's don't interview well. Yeah. And so like, we, we like to run people through like a paid challenge or like Same. we put them through like a written assessment, but that's easier to game now with chat GPT, but you can also tell when people are, are chat GPTing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, you want to set like a bunch of booby traps to find out who your Indiana Jones is. Hmm. Good point. Yeah. I've run tests. Like we do like a weekly paid test in the beginning. Um, and if someone has a question mark over doing it or not, mm-hmm. it's like, dude, if you're not willing to do the test, yeah. <laughs> then yeah. That, yeah. that sets up everything. If they're not responding to you quickly, if they're not willing to do the test, right, if they start to like, you know, the delay on, on things, it's just, it's not worth it. Because they're, they're not that excited. Yeah. Right? And then you. the question I like to ask them when they come into is like, so like, how did you prepare for this conversation, right? Mm. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, uh, so, so like, you know, what do you know about like the, the content that we put out? Oh, yeah, I, you know, I, I only looked, you know, at your website or whatever. It's like, yeah. you clearly did no research. And you also don't give a shit, right? You want yeah. the money versus anything yeah. else, just yeah. getting paid. Yep. Um, I want to ask you about lead generation. Mm-hmm. So you have a framework around the, the 60% gap. Yep. The gap of 60%. What made you come to that realization? How did you figure that out? Yeah, so we call this the the missing 60%. So, you know, this is actually during a mastermind earlier this year. We did it in Scottsdale. And um, I, I think the more extreme ends example here is that you have 5% of people that are in market ready to buy your product or service. 95% of people are not, right? Um, the How we broke it down was like, okay, maybe 20% of people are ready to buy. 20% will never buy, but it's the missing 60% or the 95% of people that you should be focusing on. You should be nurturing these people over time, whether it's through content, whether it's through your email list, whether it's through retargeting to, you know, using thought leadership ads on LinkedIn, at least for us, or doing webinars. You're constantly trying to, um, stay top of mind. That's really what it is about, at least for us, because a lot of people, when they reach out sometimes, it's just like, they might've seen me or met, met up with me at a conference recently, right? It's like, hey, by the way, we actually need this, right? Hmm. I was talking to someone on the phone yesterday about the, the conference that I'm running. And he's like, oh, by the way, like um, you guys do SEO, right? Da, 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 da. Oh, like, you know, we had this guy over here. He had founded a multi-billion dollar company. He just raised a bunch of money for this other company. Um, I don't know anybody else. Like, so you just happen to be in the right place at the right time. And um, that comes through a lot of nurturing through through content marketing. Mm. What do you think about the argument that um, nurturing doesn't work? Yeah, I think I think nurturing nurturing does because like in this case right now, like we've never met until today. This is a form of nurturing, and yeah. this is a deeper form of nurturing because we spent like you know two hours together or something like that, right? Um, and so I would just say that you know nurturing goes a long way. You have to nurture. Forget about business for a second. Everything's about relationships. Mm. If you don't put the time and effort into it, then the relationship eventually is going to decay and it's going to become nothing. So you have to continue to nurture it. It's like, you know, you and your wife, for example, you have to continue to nurture it. Yeah. Like both of you do. So, uh, everything will atrophy until you work yeah. on it. Yeah, man, because like that's a, uh, I think what you do with your agency, I guess you could go in and speak with a client or a prospect and say, we'll help you ex- generate X amount of revenue mm-hmm. or products mm-hmm. or customers. Yeah. Whereas for me, I've always called it the intangibles from podcasting that you have the tangible, which is yep. product and services and the intangibles are all the second, third, fourth order mm-hmm. of consequences. Yep. But most people who don't play an infinite game are not willing to even right. entertain the idea mm-hmm. of that. And I think to get into that front, uh, mindset, you need to obviously be at a certain stage. You don't need yep. the cash today and so on yep. and so forth. But I think if more people think like that, then that's how, like, that's how we're here today. Yeah. You know, it's a perfect example, right? Like yep. I'm, a lot further behind you and your journey, but I've done 250 episodes. You've done like two and a half thousand. Yeah. I've yeah. done 10% of yeah, those. Yeah, but it's just a time thing. Exactly. Yeah. But again, as a result, like we've had our own successes in our own right. Mm-hmm. But it's not very interesting though. Like people could look at you and think it's the business where it's not just the business. It's all the other things right. that have played into it. Right. Last question for you is how have, how has your business impacted like your relationships? So do you have a wife? No. So you're single? Girlfriend. Girlfriend. So how has that kind of affected your, or impacted positively or negatively? Like, how do you balance the two? I mean, she lets me do my thing. Yeah. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. I, I, I talked to my, um, so, you know, the, the $100 million uh, CEO dinner the other day. He's been married for 30 years. And I, so I asked him, what is the secret to your marriage? And he's like, for, for us, it's just, it comes down to space. She lets me do my thing. I let her do her thing. And mm. then when we come together, it's amazing. Um, we'll travel together and things like that. But, you know, we're separate human beings. Yep. Um, I think 
you know, one of the biggest things is for me at least is they need to let me be me because if I need to change, then I'm no longer me, you know, at the end of the day. Right. And then I can't deliver in the relationship too. Um, I can't, I can't bring my real self. So, Mm. and also what attracted your girlfriend to you is what you want to maintain. Yeah. Right. Versus you changing to be a different individual. Yeah. Right. Then it's it's inauthentic (laughs) and people can smell it. Yeah. And then there's a codependency yeah. being created. Um, yeah. And you become a people pleaser and then they hate that. Are you familiar with James Kemp? No. So James Kemp's running like a solo solo kind of business effectively. Really cool guy. Very, very interesting. Guy. You should definitely connect with him. He's recently divorced, he has two kids. And he said the biggest thing with his like relationships now is that everything doesn't have a codependency. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I was okay before I met this client. I was yeah. okay before I met my new girlfriend. Uh-huh. Therefore, I will be okay yeah. if we don't work together. Yep. Whereas in the agency space, there's a yeah. huge codependency, right? Mm-hmm. People shoot their their problems off each other. And yeah. I always like to say that like, if there's an emergency, you call 911, you don't call me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> man, I want to say a big thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, this is a great conversation. Man, for you, it's, it's so natural, right? And I can just see like everything. And I really do appreciate the time and, I'm energy, man. Yeah, likewise. I appreciate the research you put in.